Bell, you must be exhausted. If you, you've just come back. I know you've been so busy. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, how important is brands and funding to get the medals that we won this time? Yeah, it's, it's really key for us. I mean, there's, there's probably two aspects of the funding piece. The 206 National Olympic Committees around the world, but we're one of only four that doesn't receive any direct government funding. Uh, so uh, the, the issues going to Rio were, were probably pretty well documented in terms of some of the challenges there. So for us, we spent by far and away by a wide, wide margin, the most we've ever spent on supporting a team in an away games. But all of that was private sector funded, pre uh, predominantly from commercial partnerships and commercial sponsorships. So for us, um, partners, business partners, commercial revenue from the private sector is absolutely fundamental. And there's, there's a note here that says that uh, for every medal, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, um, we have to spend £5.5 .5 million pounds to get a medal. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's a bit too much? I think it's 4.4 .4 million. Plus that. But if you actually, if you, if you talk about medalists, it's 1.9 million. Um, okay. Because there were, you know, there were 27 gold medals, 67 medals in total, but that was one gold medal for hockey, but you've got 16 hockey players in the squad. So uh, He's answered this question before. Yeah, 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 I think so. It's like you go to do your A-levels. Do you remember your A-levels and the question yeah. comes up? But the... Um, uh, so I think it's about 1.9 million. Mm. Uh, if you take the, the total spend on the elite program over the four-year period, it equates to a pound a head per year uh, to, to, to the UK population. I think in terms of what it gives back, if you're successful, I think in terms of unifying the nation, making it feel better, making it feel good about itself, a sense of national confidence, I think, I think it's worth every penny. Well, I think it's worth every penny <laughs> too, but you know, I yeah. think we're probably biased from having such a, such a great success. Um, Bobby, you were at Coca-Cola before, and Coca-Cola is the longest standing sponsor of the Olympics. Um, you've run parts of, of marketing for Coke, both in the UK and, and in other countries. Is that a good investment for Coke? Is it, does it make sense? And what happens when you're in a country where the Olympics isn't? Yeah, it's, um, it's, an invest it's a significant investment. So I'll start with that. I think, um, as you say, the, the 1928 Olympics in Amsterdam were the first time that Coke got associated when the story goes Robert Woodruff s had to charter a steamer for the uh, American team to get to Amsterdam. And uh, he put on the boat a uh, number of cases of, of Coke and said, you know, share this with your, your athlete, your competitors when, when you get there. And that was the beginning of the association. And I think in those days, obviously, the ambition for Coke was to be as global as possible. And, it, and the sponsorship of, of the, uh, the partnership with the IOC was entirely appropriate. I think in, in today's world, though, at uh, the risk of sounding both heretical and a kind of bitter ex-Coke employee. It, it's, it's, uh, and, and by the way, I'm neither. The, uh, the, uh, the, the model is, is just not, it doesn't function. Um, partly because, whether you're hosting a games or, or not for that matter, partly because competitively, you know, it must be the, the easiest job in the world to be the Pepsi marketing director. Right, so even numbered year. So this is 2016. So Coke have got the European Championships from April through to July, and then they've got the Olympics. So we'll do a ton of price promotions. We'll ambush everything going in that period because you know it's utterly predictable the the, the plan that Coca-Cola has in that period. So from that point of view, it's it's a competitive disadvantage actually in many ways to to be known as one of the top sponsors. Uh, I think uh, where, it, where it does work, ironically, is where it is in your own country. I was in Canada in 2010 during the, the Winter Games, and um, we had a massive reorganization. We'd restructured the entire business, and we made sure that every single associate in the Coca-Cola system in Canada had some sort of association with those games, and they were terrific. And I think most people would say that they're the best Winter Games that there have been in Vancouver. And um, you know, from that point of view, internal uh, galvanization, it was terrific. But commercially, it's, it's really tough because, because your competitor knows what, knows what you're up to. It's often said, actually, that uh, within Coke, that the reason why Coke sponsors the Olympics is actually not for the games themselves, uh, but for the torch relay. Right. Um, because uh, we have first refusal on uh, association with, with the torch relay. And I uh, was paid the highest compliment by the, the Globe and Mail, actually, when I was in Canada, um, who wrote a headline which was, on the way to the Coke commercial, I was inter uh, interrupted by the Olympic torch. And, um, <laughs> and, and, it, and it was unashamedly uh, an association that we pushed very hard um, a, as a result. Because we were more relevant in that environment, we were going across the country and you know, given the chance to sample 
uh, yeah. Coke and Coke Zero at the time. Yeah. Okay. Sophie, so uh, talk to me about, you've had 700, there were 700 people over the Olympics. You've looked after about 12 brands over there. Um, talk to me about a brand that is doing something really good or something that's happening that's really innovative. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, tough to choose. I mean, there were so many brands activating fantastically well. I mean, credit to, to Bill and the BOA, I think, the way that you partnered up with uh, various brands. I mean, Adidas, Lidl, which was very innovative, DFS and, and others, I think, really sort of set, set new standards. Um, I was fortunate enough to go over to Rio for a few days and so got to see a lot of it firsthand. And um, given some of the challenges on the ground, it looked quite different on TV to maybe how it was over in Rio, although it was still a very special experience. I mean, the one that stood out to me was Bradesco, which uh, right. was the largest local partner, the biggest bank in Brazil. Um, and uh, the way they went about their activation was, was fantastic. It was planned very far in advance. Um, they had very clear objectives um, from a business standpoint, but really bought into the local organizing committee in Rio legacy um, objectives as well. So it was really properly integrated from a grassroots standpoint. They launched a schools program six months in advance to really educate <laughs> school children around what the Olympics means, around the different international cultures. Um, so that really opened, I think, everyone's eyes through to what they did in the lead up to the game. They were the games, they were the official sponsor of the mascots um, yeah. and so reached a much broader fan base, people that maybe weren't interested in the sport, got to know the local mascot very well. Um, and then what they did during the games themselves from a, a promotional standpoint through all their banks, thousands of banks around the country were completely branded. There are all sorts of live events taking place. They had a touring property that went on throughout the whole mm. games. In fact, it went so well, they extended it through to the Paralympics, which they only decided a week before, so that caused us a few issues, <laughs> but we got around that. It was a little bit lastminute.com. Yeah. And then from a B2B standpoint, they entertained over 6,000 guests during the right. almost three-week period. So fully integrated, um, and it, to me, it really stood out. You couldn't be in the country without noticing what they were doing. A very colorful, vibrant, above-the-line campaign as well, um, which was, was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and did you, Bill, from, from 2012 to now, have you seen a kind of evolution of the relationships that um, brands and, and the Olympics has had, particularly in the UK? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think um, uh, all of the various partners we have, whether it's, whether it's Aldi or whether it's DFS or Adidas or, or BP, they all, they all work with us on, on what they particularly want from the relationship. Uh, in BP's case, it's very much about employee engagement. Uh, they don't feel they want to use that from a, in, in a consumer-facing way. Um, so all, the, all of the, uh, the activations are very much tailored and bespoke to the needs of that particular uh, partner and, uh, and brand. Uh, perhaps one of the most innovative and interesting ones was the National Lottery. So um, National Lottery aren't actually a partner of ours because, uh, as I said before, we don't receive any government funding. So over a four-year period, that 350 million, of which they contribute 70%, that goes direct to the elite athletes. We don't touch that. So in some ways, you could say, well, they're not really a partner. But on the other hand, without that investment, we'd have a, an inferior product, yeah. if you like, because uh, it, it would definitely affect the performance of the athletes. So we wanted to partner with them. And then coming back, one of the key, key objectives we have now is how do, you, how do you translate that performance on the track and on the field and, and in competition? How do, you, how do you use that to actually grow participation in this country, which is quite a, a thorny yeah. subject? Yeah. Uh, so I don't, you, you probably saw it, but there was a partnership with TNGV, National Lottery and ITV Television. They switched off for an hour, said don't watch TV, go out and do sport. Yeah. Uh, and on that, on that Saturday when we flew back, there were 892,000 people apparently, that's the latest figure turned up to play sport. So that partnership with them and how they activated that on television makes us or helps us to be a, a healthier brand. Yeah, that's true. Dave, um, at News UK, did you see the impact of, of the Olympics? Did you, did you see an uplift that you didn't expect because it wasn't in the UK? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fascinating thing was, you know, four years ago, it was such a, a, a massive event for London and the wider UK that we were kind of a little bit skeptical about how it was going to play out this time. Uh, and what you tend to find with these these big uh, marquee events is that um, unless it's the World Cup where you definitely get a lead into it, uh, it's only when it kicks off that you really you really feel it. Um, and and with the Olympics this time, and there was such a, a buzz around it uh, that we saw advertising really uh, kick up mainly through the um, through the, uh, the 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 Team GB partners, uh, and we were able to provide sort of contextualized solutions for them. So rather than just having an ad stuck in the paper somewhere, you know, we, we would uh, we would place the ad next to the, the, yeah. the Olympic content and so on. So it, and and by the time you got to the end of the Olympics, there was the pullouts and the, uh, all the souvenir stuff. Yeah, so it was a real, 
it, it was a nice way to spend August, if I can put yeah. it like that. Yeah, so <laughs> nice life, really. Yeah. Um, Bobby, now you're at Godolphin Racing. Um, what are you looking for? And part of your role is partnerships. What, what kind of things are you looking for when you're looking at partnerships? I suppose the first thing to say is that it's you know, fizzy drinks to mm. thoroughbred horse racing is, is a bit of a jump. And that <laughs> one, of the, one of the biggest jumps is, uh, and they're flat horses, the... Um, <laughs> the the fact that it is, it is inherently not a commercial operation. So the first thing I, I would say is that uh, any partnership is, is, is a non-financial one, fundamentally. Mm -hmm. It has to be where there is a mutuality of need. Uh, I'll give you a, an example of, of a very valuable partner to, to Godolphin, and that's Under Armour. Under Armour um, were interested in working with Godolphin to supply all of the, uh, the team Godolphin uh, uniforms, that's all the stable staff, the trainers, and of course the jockeys, with the, the very leading edge uh, uh, equipment and, and clothing in particular, because th they saw there was an opportunity to break into the three billion dollar global equine clothing mm. market, which nobody currently occupies. Uh, and so working with Under Armour, we, we are now producing on an annual basis a range of clothing that is absolutely leading edge. But no money is changing hands. It's, it's very much a partnership of, of mutual interest. And, and we will continue to look for partners uh, of a similar ilk. So Sophie, if, if that's what brands want to do, is that gonna put you out of business? No, I don't think so. I think it's very synergistic to what we're all trying to do. I think you do need more flexibility going forwards. I think we all want long-term contracts and arrangements because these things do take time to evolve, but I think they need to be on a flexible um, basis, and I think it, it's very much evolving. And you, I think, develop these partnerships together. The days of sort of a gold, uh, silver, bronze option is, is far gone. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, what Bobby says is absolutely the way, way forward. Mm. Well, we talked about this before, Bill, but one of the things that uh, is, is always talked about is the fast foods, fizzy drinks, uh, gambling that is associated with the Olympics and a lot of other sport. Um, do you think it's right? Do you think that you should take money collectively, you should work in that kind of environment with, with those sorts of brands when you're actually dealing with sport? Uh, I, th I think it depends on how it's executed. If you, we, uh, we signed an agreement with uh, the Heineken Strongbow Group uh, just before Rio, and that was all about the fact that we were now 6,000 miles away in Rio, but we had a massive fan base in the UK. Uh, we thought we'd be successful. You know, we, we knew we were taking a strong team over there. Uh, so that campaign was all about own the moment and celebrate victory. Uh, and it didn't feature athletes. It was only the fans themselves. And it was all about the celebration of having a drink, and you know, that's part of our culture. Is, you know, when we celebrate, we tend to have one or two. So I think in that context, um, I think it's fine. You know, I think it's all, it, it's all to do with the content, it's all to do with the, the message that you're trying to get out, and I, I, think it's, I think it's fair. How do you look at it? Yeah, I think um, ultimately the rights holder has a lot of control. I mean, if, if the contract's structured correctly, you have approval rights over how the messaging works, and mm. um, ultimately that investment helps develop grassroots and lead to a lot of the success um, that Team GB had. I mean, an interesting example that we've worked on is with Johnny Walker in Formula One. So they're a big Formula One partner, um, which you would think from the outside might be a bit of a disconnect. Um, but their campaign has all been around responsible driving, but in particular, the designated driver and heroing that whole idea. Yeah. Make a big deal, choose the person early in the night. And the way that they've brought that to life creatively is, is fantastic and has put a whole different spin on it and actually is a real a real positive. So I think it's it's all in the messaging and finding that balance. But ultimately, the rights holder has has a lot of control over how it's positioned, um, and being a bit commercial about it, that you know that revenue can transform sports and transform lives. Yeah. So um, I think you know there is there is a way mm. of doing it in the right. Bobby, you live you live for ten years with with Coke, probably having parts of that conversation. Um, did you did you experience that when you're talking about partnerships and sponsorships? The, uh, the appropriateness of our involvement. Yeah. Look, I mean, we, we were very, very clear. I remember at the time being, you've got to be very front foot and say that, you know, without, as Bill has said, without the sponsorship, without the involvement of major organizations, we wouldn't be as successful. The Olympics would not be as great a show were it not for all of the brands that have been involved in that. And obviously Coke was the, was the longest standing, as, as you say. So no, we're absolutely unashamed about the, about the involvement. Mm. And then just before we go on to the next bit, um, 
things when it hasn't worked quite according to plan. Um, I mean, I know that I know people are tweeting, so you don't have to be too. too but are there any stories that you can share of where it hasn't been quite as perfect as you'd expected? I can't think of any. Actually. Oh. No. Oh. Oh. Well, so go oh, on, Bobby. Just, uh, go on, tell us okay. one. I'll um, I'll tell tales out of school because <laughs> I am. Um, you can tell he's left coat. <laughs> yeah. I would, um, having, having sung the praises of the Olympic torch relay, and I think at a local level in Canada, as I say, in 2010, it was mm. spectacular. It was not that in 2008. So the lead up to the Beijing Olympics, the, the torch relay, which was yeah, probably the last time it'll ever be a global event, was hijacked pretty much everywhere that it went. And it was a, it was a trauma. It, it was not a good place to be for anyone involved in it. And in fact, from a, from a celebration of uh, communality and, and uh, human spirit, it became uh, an exercise in survival. And many of the associates that were involved with it from the Coke company were traumatized by it. And it was, it was not a pleasant place to be, either carrying the torch or being involved in supporting that torch relay around the world. So I would say that, you know, that, that, that was probably a low point in, in the experience. There were, I mean, there, were, there was a number of issues before the Olympics. Um, what did you, did you have to talk to your, the brands that you were working with about that? Was, was it something they were particularly anxious about? That the potential for things to go wrong in Rio seems to be much greater than in, in some of the other Olympics. Yeah, I think it was um, highlighted by the media in particular very, very strongly. So I think there was a lot of planning for that in advance and that everyone was well aware of the potential um, issues. I think in Rio in general, it's quite hard to plan in advance. However much you put <laughs> attention into the detail, it yeah. doesn't quite go right. So, you know, yeah. that was a challenge. Not everything went went right, but I think people went in with that, that attitude. And, you know, depending on how you were going to activate, you could still get a lot of out of it. I think that's the beauty, especially in maybe more challenging um, environments or emerging markets, um, what you can do digitally, socially, which can be much more reactive and potentially a little bit more last minute makes that avenue a bit more appealing because yeah. some of the best laid plans don't yeah, quite go quite. Um, how did, as you would think. How did everyone feel when the pool went green? <laughs> yeah, I didn't, actually, I didn't actually see that. I mean, there's a lot of talk about it. But I mean, just to that point, though, going into <laughs> Rio, I remember giving a presentation to our board and I said, you know, we're off to Rio in the next week or so and we've got political turmoil, we've got economic meltdown, we've got budget reductions, we've got venue <laughs> readiness, we've got security concerns, we've got water quality issues, ticketing, transportation. I think that was about it. But yeah, apart from that, it should be fine. So, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so we were nervous, yeah, we, we weren't quite sure, yeah. but, but w yeah. we were there nine times in two years and, and we had a risk register that was about this long. Yeah. So for yeah. any, and you, you're yeah. never gonna forecast everything, but for every, yeah conceivable thing that we thought would be an issue that would come up. We, we had various different scenarios to try and handle it. And luckily, nothing came up. You know, I didn't see a mosquito, so there's no Zika. That's good.